Well, good morning. In my hometown, there was a restaurant chain called King's Table. It was a buffet, all you can eat, and it was great. Why was it great, especially as a kid? Because everyone can get exactly what they want. And more importantly, you cannot get what you don't want. So if you want the fried shrimp, the pizza, the ice cream, great. If you don't want the mac and cheese, the roast beef, or the salad, nope. That was good times, that buffet. But the Bible is not like a buffet. It's not a book where we can take this big helping of Romans chapter 8 and then go back for more. And then we can take a little bit of Romans chapter 3, and then we can just skip out entirely in Romans chapter 9 altogether because I don't like it. But the, the most challenging passages of the Bible are often the ones that stretch our faith. Maybe they highlight the difference in the way I think versus the way the, the God thinks in the Bible, what the Bible says. And these kind of differences force me to reconsider. There are things to figure out in the Bible and problems to solve, but overall I shouldn't approach the Bible like a puzzle. I shouldn't approach the Bible like something to consider and ponder as much as words to believe. The very words of God, which brings us to Romans. So let's open up in prayer and then we'll jump in. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we can't understand you and your will uh, by mere philosophy or by looking within ourselves. The Spirit of God knows the things of God, and so we ask for your Spirit to guide us in your word this morning for your glory. We pray things in your name. Amen. Well, Romans chapter 8 was about the promise of God, both present and in the future. And I'd like to make this comparison. It's kind of like taking a tour of this grand mansion. And the tour is for people who are going to live there. Uh, so for four weeks, we spent in chapter 8 because it was, it was this mansion with many beautiful rooms. Many promises such as, there is therefore now no condemnation. The text says, we are joint heirs with Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. We are called, predestined, justified, and glorified. We are more than conquerors. Nothing shall separate from us from the love of Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? And then the last two verses we ended with last week, verse 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Uh, so the prom- these are the promises and the hope that believers have. And such blessing leads to questions, and these are tough questions. So chapter 9 deals uh, with a little bit of change in direction. Specifically, the question is this. What about God's promises to Israel? Have they failed? I mean, Israel was God's chosen people after all. Paul is going to begin to answer this, but first he speaks from the heart. In verse 1 he says this, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I, for I could wish that I, I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So in verse 1, Paul really wants to communicate his sincerity. So he says it in multiple ways. He says, I'm not, I, I, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. And finally, he says, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. So he's very adamant. What is he adamant about? Well, verse 2, he says he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish. So it definitely sounds serious, but but what has pushed him specifically to this mental and emotional state? Well, it's his love for his fellow Israelites, who for the most part have rejected the Messiah. And so it really is a cause of great grief and sorrow to him. So, you know, by, for example, if you're a parent and you had two kids that both needed a kidney and uh, you were the only one that was a match, would you do it? Would you give one kidney to each if it meant that you had to die? Now, some of you may be saying, well, I have more than two kids, which which two? But the point is that many or all of you parents would do it. If it came down to it, if it was you or them, you would give up everything for them. And so it is with Paul. He gives a hypothetical. He said, if it was possible to trade places with my fellow Israelites, says says Paul, I I, I would. Verse 3, it says he would be accursed, literally in Greek, anathema. In uh, In the next verse, cut off from Christ. Whoa. Cut off from Christ. You hear what he just said? He said, condemned to hell. Cut off from Christ. 
He says, I, will give my, I would give my soul and my salvation for them. It's a, and this is a very noble statement, and it's very sincere, but it's hypothetical. Of course, it really doesn't work that way. So these promises of God from chapter 8 are a double-edged sword. They're great if you're on the receiving end, as chapter 8 says, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And they're not so good if you're left out. Because Romans also says the wrath of God is revealed against heaven, uh, from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness. Thus, we have this dual emotion. We have Paul as joyful and sorrowful both. And this is, this is a good thing for us to emulate. We should have the same heart as we contemplate God and joy, but also the same sorrow for people around us that don't know him. So with that picture of concern and introduction here, in light of Israel's rejection of the Messiah, Paul begins to answer a series of questions in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. So we're going to pick up in verse 4 of chapter 9. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them be belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So just in passing, um, note that verse 5 is a very strong declaration of the divinity of Jesus. Now, that's not Paul's main point, but I just want to note that as we go along. What is his main point? Well, it's very simple. Israel had a ton of blessings. They had the covenants. They had the law. They had the promises. It, said that, it says here that the Jews had the adoption, the glory, and the worship. Even the Messiah came through the Jewish nation. Humanly speaking, Jesus was Jewish. They were God's chosen, chosen people. And all of this, of course, is from the Old Testament. So what's the problem again? Well, Israel, again, has m largely or mostly rejected the Messiah. All those promises from God in chapter 8, how can it all be true? God promised to be their God. Was God's word wrong? Well, let's pick it up in verse 6. He's going to answer that. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. In other words, the, the failure or the problem is not a problem with God or God's promises or God's word continue on. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Okay, interesting. Not all, are who, not all descended from Israel really belong to Israel. In other words, you can be Jewish, but that's not it. Jesus told Nic Nicodemus that you must be born again because you may be ethnically a Jew, but it doesn't mean you're going to be a child of God. Just because you're born into a nation with those promises written down in their law, doesn't mean that you believe them. To use the language from Romans, we have our physical identity according to the flesh, but Christians have a new spiritual identity in Christ. You must be born not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. So now he's going to explain this using an Old Testament, an example from Old Testament history. Now, so we're, as we go through this, remember this genealogy, Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. So we're going to pick up in verse 7. Verse 7, And not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but, quote, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Well, Jews were proud to call Abraham their father. In the Gospel of John, for example, Jesus said to the Pharisees, the truth shall set you free. The Pharisees were fairly indignant. They, they respond and say, well, we're, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been a slave to anyone. It's kind of their rallying cry. We are offspring of Abraham. But Abraham had two sons. Ishmael was the firstborn, and then Isaac, because God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son, and they doubted because Sarah was too old. So Sarah had this idea that Abraham could have a son through her servant, Hagar. And that's a bad idea. Now, this son was a child of promise. Well, it wasn't the child of promise. He, rather, was the child of the flesh. Isaac, the second son, was a child of promise, and he was supernaturally born as promised through Sarah. And, and the connection? Well, just because you're descended from Abraham doesn't mean you were a child of the promise. Abraham had two sons. They were both descendants of Abraham. Now, remember, being a Jew had all kinds of blessings. The law, the patriarchs, the promise of Messiah, all that stuff, great. But it doesn't mean they believed it. Some did, some didn't. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Just because you're born a Jew doesn't mean that you're born again. All right, let's pick, continue in verse 8. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the, this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I'll return and Sarah shall have a son. Okay, great. So we got this picture. Isaac is a child of the promise. 
Ishmael, the firstborn child of the flesh. Got it. God doesn't choose the firstborn in this case, Ishmael, but he rather chooses the secondborn, Isaac. He kind of goes against man's rule for firstborn blessings and chooses Isaac, the child of the promise. A simple choice. Now, remember this rallying cry from the Jews. We are offspring of Abraham. Well, scratch that because the new rallying cry is, well, we're offspring of Isaac, the child of the promise, the second son of Abraham. But wait, wait, it's not that simple. Verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they, they were not yet born and didn't, had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older shall serve the younger. Wow. The next generation. More of the same. We have Isaac has two sons, and they're twins, Jacob and Esau. And it says, though they were not yet born, nothing, uh, neither had done anything good or bad. And again, as with Isaac over Ishmael, and in this case, Jacob and Esau, the younger son is chosen. Jacob rather than Esau. And why was Jacob chosen, not Esau? It's a key question. And first, verse 11 makes it really clear that it was nothing they did. It says, though they were not yet born, they had done nothing either good or bad. And it also says, not by works, not because of works. God chose Jacob before he was born. And it wasn't based upon Jacob's good works later either. Later in life, Jacob was a real rascal. He manipulated and he lied to his dad. But God chose Jacob before he was born, the text says. Thus, it's really simple. God's mercy is not by good works. This isn't new information. All over the Bible, it says, uh, such, such as Titus chapter 3, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Or Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one should boast. So it's not because of Jacob himself. Then what is it? Why did God choose Jacob? Well, look right in the middle of verse 11. In order that God's purpose of election might continue. Okay, what kind of answer is that? It sounds a little bit like a non-answer. It's kind of like when a parent answers a question with this, saying, it's because I'm the parent, that's why. Or my favorite, which is, because I said so. And that's a really good one when you're a parent. I used it more than once. Uh, per day sometimes, because when you're a parent, you have to make these decisions and explain them. And sometimes they're hard to explain. If there's a curfew that you set at 9 p.m., the kid might ask, why? Now, in such a case, parents, is it useful to give a reason? Maybe you could give a reason like this. Uh, you need to have a curfew because I don't want you wandering around town late at night. It's not safe. Well, will that reason satisfy the kid? Will it make them feel secure and content in the knowledge that you're concerned for their safety? Maybe. But many parents find that they've trained little lawyers. Lawyers just need something specific to question and attack. And they'll say, objection. That's not a valid reason. In this case, I'm going to be very safe after 9 p.m. because of this, this, and this. Are kids good lawyers? Well, sure. But you know what? They don't want to remain lawyers. They want to be the judge. They want to decide what is fair and just. Sometimes it's easier to say, it's 9 p.m. because I said so. So why did God choose Jacob? It's simple. It says, in order to, to, that God's purposes of election might stand. Now, here comes an interesting sentence in verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I hated. Now, the word hated doesn't mean despised. Love versus hate here is this idea of favor. Esau the man was quite a blessed man in his time, but he wasn't chosen by God. Now that we should note that there's two dimensions to this, both present in this chapter. There's Esau and Jacob, the two brothers. That story is in Genesis, the first book in the Bible. But this quote that Paul has is out of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And Esau in this reference is not the man Esau, but the nation called Edomites. Now, that doesn't change things or fix the tension here. It just expands the scope. Instead of God loving Jacob and hating Esau, the man, God now chooses an entire nation and doesn't choose another nation called Edom. Is that fair? 
So that's where Paul pushes this next. Is God being fair? Let's continue on in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. In other words, Paul says here, don't judge God. What God does is just. And don't go calling God unjust. If anything, God's justice would demand that we all went to hell. That would be just. It's only because of God's mercy that we aren't all immediately cast from his presence. So who gets God's mercy? Verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So in summary, God says, I can do whatever I want. I'm God. Simply put, it's, it's all God at every level. When it comes to the mercy shown to sinful man, there are a lot of questions. Why? Answer, God. How? Answer, God. Not man, God. To what purpose? God's purpose. Who exactly gets this mercy? To those who God shows mercy. So this Christian worldview presented here is pretty simple. It starts with two propositions. There is a God and you're not him. That's a pretty good place to start. But Paul's not really done with this yet. He's got a ways to go. If this was an infomercial, he'd say, but wait, there's more. Because there's another side to this coin that we have to consider. Same coin, another aspect to it. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he, has, he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Wow, oh boy. So it's not just mercy to some, but it's also hard hearts to others. Now, this references the book of Exodus, where the Pharaoh had the multiple conversations with Moses about letting the, the Israelites go, and Pharaoh digs in his heels. Now, one way to attempt to mitigate this kind of situation and explain the implication of it is that we could point out that the text back in Exodus, not, Exodus clearly says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And it says that multiple times. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then later in chapter 9 it says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So we might explain it and say, well, it's like God says, Pharaoh, I'm going to use you one way or another. Oh, Pharaoh, you keep hardening your heart. So be it. I'll use you as a bad example. Since you're already hardening your heart, I'll harden it more to show you my, my glory. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do that. And that does that rationalization work? Well, it, it is a point noted. But I don't, it's not part of Paul's explanation here. Paul states it quite strong. Pharaoh was raised up and God hardened Pharaoh. Why? Well, so that God's name might be, might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and hardens whomever he wills. So again, the Bible's not a buffet where you take what you want and leave the rest behind. This isn't a fast food drive through either. This is a sit-down dinner where you eat what's put in front of you. And it's not meant here to be off-putting. This is an insight into God's sovereignty. God's name will be proclaimed. His purposes will be accomplished. Well, as if Paul hasn't ridden this horse long and hard, he's going to keep on picking at this point. Verse 19, You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Well, um, so like a, like a kid, it's very easy to question the justice of this situation. If, the, if God called some but hardened others, then that can't be anyone's fault, can it? And the answer here is real simple. Don't talk back to God. He's the creator. He's sovereign. And this is a very similar answer to that which we received from God in the book of Job. In chapter 38 of Job, after all of this long speculation about God and his purposes, God says out of the whirlwind, he says, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. Let me paraphrase. God says, Who is questioning me? Put on your big boy pants. Because let's go, you and me. God then asks questions of Job for several chapters. And in chapter 40, he says, 
he pauses and says, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? In other words, do you really want to find fault with God? Job's, phrase, uh, Job's uh, response to paraphrase is, uh, good point, God. Thanks. I'll keep quiet for now. And so the book of Job, like Romans, is fairly sobering at times. This isn't the children's Bible with the Lord is my shepherd in a big, colorful font. It's not soft peddling who God is and what he's doing. It doesn't explain all the reasons for everything God does. It says, trust God. It says, God is righteous. God is good. God is merciful. Trust him. And in Job, what we had is a series of rhetorical questions. And likewise, we go back to Romans 9, Paul has a series of questions starting in verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Okay, maybe you find this a little alarming, a little uncomfortable. What if God created men like Pharaoh in order to wipe them out? Why? Well, so that his purposes, that his wrath, that his power, that the riches of his glory will be made known. Now, this is sure is intention with man's sense of fairness. Perhaps I could draw some comfort from the fact in this passage in verse 22 that it's hypothetical. What if God were like this? But hypothetical or not, the message is clear. God is creator. God is sovereign. God has the right to do what he wants with what he's created. And this is challenging because predestination presents God's sovereignty from God's perspective. Now, there is another side to this. And normally people contrast uh, the two sides being God's predestination and man's free will. But I don't take this a different direction. The other side to predestination is the heart of God. And the heart of God is clear in the Bible as well. Ezekiel 33 says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. God doesn't delight that the wicked are going to die. He wants them to repent. In the New Testament, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So from the perspective of God as sovereign creator, on the one hand, he chose you, he predestined you. From the perspective of God's heart for his creation, he wants all to repent. He doesn't want any to, to perish. Choose God, believe in Jesus. And of, of course, these two uh, items are intention, but you should believe it. And, but you could only go so far to actually resolve that tension. So I accept it. I accept it not because I completely understand it. I, I can't diagram it for you. It says that we are chosen beforehand, and it tells us to choose him. Now, if all of that, short summary, if all that makes wonderful and complete sense to you, and if what I said about predestination is easy to understand, then come talk to me because you missed something. Now, Paul has one more important thing to say in conclusion. He has a unique way of defending God. As he did previously in this chapter, he defends God by quoting God. Now, remember the question we start out with, did God wor God's word fail? And starting in verse 25, he's going to quote from Hosea and then Isaiah, showing that God's word didn't fail, Israel's unfaithfulness was clearly known all along. God knew it would happen, and he chose to save a remnant. So let's pick it up. He quotes Isaiah in verse 25. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not, my, not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it's, it was said to them, you are not my people, there, then there they will be called sons of the living God. Now, this, this is an interesting play on words in Hosea. Because not my people, that was the name of Hosea's son. His daughter was named No Mercy. And if you read the book, God turns Hosea's family into this big object lesson. Hosea's wife was unfaithful. So let me read just a little bit more from Hosea uh, chapter 2 around this. And I will betroth to you, you to me forever. I will betroth 
you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast fast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And I will have mercy on no mercy. I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Wow. Um, you know, it's quite a, quite a picture here. Uh, none of us deserved God's mercy, either Jew or Gentile. None of us deserved to be God's people. None of us deserved to be God's beloved. But in God's purposes, God's mercy was on those whom he had mercy. Now, Paul finishes this with a quote out of Isaiah, starting in verse 27. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them, them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as, as Isaiah predicted, If the Lord of hosts had not let, left us uh, offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Wow. Well, so God's word didn't fail. The promises didn't fail. Not all of Israel is lost. A remnant will be saved, which is a theme that's going to be picked up again in chapter 11. But it's still dire. Because if God wasn't merciful, we'd all be toast. That's what it says here. The question of predestination isn't so much about why God condemns people to hell. That's actually easier under, to understand than why God chose to show mercy to any at all. As it says here, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. We would have been wiped out. But there's a remnant, just like with Sodom and Gomorrah. God pulled Lot out. There's a remnant preserved by God. So let's con con conclude by circling back around to the beginning. We started chapter 9 with a discussion of Paul's heart for his people. He was even willing to be accursed so that the rebellious Jews might be saved. Now here's a wild question. Could God actually accept Paul's offer to trade? Nope. Now, it was very generous of Paul, but Paul can't make that trade. It doesn't work like that. Paul can't take on anyone else's sin. Paul has no righteousness of his own. But Jesus can, because Jesus became accursed so that rebellious people might be saved. Galatians 3.13 summarizes this nicely. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For as it is written, cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Jesus became a curse for the people he loved. Through him, you and I might have the blessing of Abraham. Now, I don't know exactly how God's plans will play out in every little detail. But the call is very clear. Choose this day whom you will serve, and today is the day of salvation. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, your ways are not our ways. You chose your people before the foundation of the world, and yet you call upon us to repent and follow you. And we believe it. We accept these words from Romans chapter 9. We pray things in your name. Amen.